We equally reject attempts to prescribe new rights that are contrary to our values, norms, traditions and beliefs. We are not gays. provision in the constitution forbids same-sex marriages and uphold that until that issue in our country. In recent weeks, we've heard terrifying accounts from Chechnya, of gay and bisexual men being taken from their homes and families, tortured, even killed. The United States government, yes, this government, should demand an end to the persecution of innocent people across the world. The 10th of December is celebrated worldwide as an International Human Rights Day um, and the theme for the 2022 uh, International Human Rights Day is the dignity, freedom and justice for all. Now, this justice for all is regardless of race, creed, uh, uh, ethnic, uh, ethnicity or even sexual orientation. And here on this, the Heart and Soul TV and radio on the situation right now with me, your host as usual, Dara Blessed Mshlanga. We're going to be discussing issues around gays and lesbians rights in Zimbabwe and we're going to be having a discussion that talks about freedom of sexuality in proud partnership with girls. Now join me after this break with me, your host as usual, Dara. <laughs> Welcome back to This The Situation right now with me, your host, Dara, in proud partnership with GALS. Now, we are celebrating the International Human Rights Day. And, you know, there's a report that has been uh, produced. The, the, viol the violations um, on GALS, as it was first published, uh, violations report shows that the abuse illegal and inhuman treatment that persons of same-sex sexuality and minority gender identities succumb to on mere basis of identifying themselves and belonging to identities different from the norm. In the past, uh, where we had the President of the Republic then ousted and now late, President Robert Gabriel Mugabe used to compare them to Western dogs and pigs, but they have rights, they are humans. Now to help me discuss and ventilate these issues, I've got uh, two special guests in the studios today. I just ahead of Christmas, as you can see the Christmas lights behind me. We're gonna be discussing rights regardless of sexual preferences. I just want to welcome you into the studio and thank you very much for joining me um, on this day of um, human rights, the International Day of Human Rights. Now I'll ask you, uh, Jerry, to just introduce yourself um, and what you do. Thank you, Dara, for having me on the show. My name is Jeremiah Bamu. I'm a human rights attorney and I done quite a number of cases relating to the LGBTQ community. My name is Martha Tolana. I'm a human rights advocate and, public and also a health advocate as well. I've worked uh, with uh, the LGBTI Association uh, since 2003. Amazing. Now, now we 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 are talking about the LGBTIQ uh, community, and and on this um, Human Rights Day. Now, why is this of importance, Martha? That we talk about this. Why why should we even be talking about it today? Uh, I think the 
the title says it all, human, human rights. So which means that the rights of every human being and um, and when we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which which was uh, proclaimed on the 10th of December, and this is why we continue to to commemorate, to celebrate, but also a reminder that there are people that we forget about, uh, people we may think are not important, but to say every human being is human and deserves to be considered as a human being, just that. Mm, amazing, but um, do, is, is there any reason why we should have, we should pay uh, special attention to the LGBTIQ community um, on this particular day? The, something that would worry you so that we would have to talk about it? Yeah, for me, I think it's because, um, the first of all, they are human beings, and then we we have imported homophobia, which we pretend it's cultural, but I think it was brought by the British colonialists, uh, the homophobia that we currently uh, we currently claim to be our own cultural values. That is that has never been in our cultural values. So I think we need to go back where uh, everyone was respected in our culture. Uh, people who were minorities and vulnerable were protected by our culture. So this is this is why this is why we should keep paying attention to every human being, including uh, LGBTIQ persons. Amazing. Now I'll come. I'll come to you, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you're a human rights lawyer. I'm, I mean, I I, I know this uh, first-hand experience. You know, uh, I've been arrested, and you've been uh, by my side and and fighting and defending for my freedom of expression, freedom of of speech. Uh, but this this year's theme is dignity, freedom, and justice for all. I mean, how do you connect it to our discussion today? Uh, the first thing is that we are speaking of human dignity. We are speaking of freedom and we are speaking of justice. But the key word, uh, as Mother said previously, is for all. So the qualifying factor is what do we consider to be human? What is a human being? Who is a human? As long as you have that definition in front of you and say so and so is a human, before you put any prejudices, then that person is entitled to rights. So my favorite definition of human rights is a mathematical equation. Human plus rights equals human rights. So as long as you have a human, you have rights, you have human rights. So we discuss human rights regardless of any uh, differences in race, in culture, in religion, sexual preferences, or the type of food or clothes that you want to wear. As long as you're human, you're entitled to human rights, and therefore human rights must be for all. Justice is for all, dignity is for all, freedom is for all. Amazing. But, uh, but when, why do we have to pay this special attention? Has there been a denial or an attempt to deny other humans their rights, especially the LGBTIQ community? We often live, rather we live in this society where we speak of the majority being dominant. Uh, but there's a counter narrative to it. The majority is not always right. So when we are speaking of human rights, we are not only speaking of the protection of the majority, because the majority always is their way anyway. We are also concerned with how we are protecting the vulnerable groups amongst society. That is what gives us dignity as a people. The care, attention, and protection that we give to our vulnerable groups is what, make, what, what makes us stand out as a people that is tolerant, as a society that is reflective of communal values. Mm -hmm. now, now I want to come. To, I want to turn to you, Martha, as as, as Jerry talks about communal values, as, as 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 respect. Are there any gender issues that you would that we should would flag out? You know, in line with this theme. You know, what, what are the gender issues? Uh, you know, the nuances that we need to talk about. Uh, yes, uh, Dara said there are issues around gender identities. Uh, there's the gender that people see when I walk, um, when I'm walking outside, and people assume that I'm a certain gender, or maybe it's the way that I dress, maybe it's the way that I talk, um, or maybe it's the way that I carry, I carry myself, and then people decide. And then there's the gender that is assigned. 
uh, at birth, like they, they look at a child, okay, congratulations, you have a boy, congratulations, we have a girl. And those are, you know, those are identities. But we've increasingly seen, it's increasingly, increasingly coming out in the open uh, that there are a, a number of um, a number of children who they've always been there. Who, were, who, who now the parents would say we yes we were told congratulations we have a baby boy, but now we are not so sure if it's a boy because maybe because of the genitalia or maybe when the when the child is born they can't even tell because of what we call ambiguous uh, genitalia. Uh, long before they used to call these children hermaphrodite, but that's another aspect. And right now we call them intersex. This is the I in the LGBTIQ. And so that is that is one aspect. But also then there's there there are also those who are born. They say they are, they say definitely this is a girl, uh, because of the what this what people can visually see when the baby is born. Um, but then as the child grows. Uh, then they say that the child, then they say, is showing, you know, tendencies, especially at adolescence time. Then they say, no, this is now confusing for for the for the child just because they've been brought up probably as a girl and they are now um, exhibiting features of a features and behaviors of a boy, and vice versa. And sometimes it's also to do with the chromosomes. Um, I know that people right now they, they, they throw a lot of insults, but we do have the, the T in the in, in the in that alphabet which is the transgender and this is where they also come in. Uh, and some it's not always so obvious. Some also suppress for a long time so that they go through school, so that they go through a job. And at some point someone decides, no, I'm not going to continue hiding, I'm going to be myself. And this is when they come into conflict with the majority that uh, Jeremiah was talking about, and rather than the majority, uh, you know, actually protecting uh, people who are vulnerable, which we used to do culturally um, and traditionally, now it's like people now get attacked and are actually in danger from <laughs> from their own, mm -hmm. uh, from their own who are in the majority. So uh, the, the the spirit of Ubuntu, I think, it manifests in how we protect the minorities. But is, is this is this a natural? You, you you speak about this. I know you've been you you have been in the health system and you've you've worked there for a long time, and 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 there are some people who say this is something that someone actually actively chooses to be. So, so from what you are describing and 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 talking to me about is is as if this this is a natural occurrence. Of yeah, from the from the over twenty years that I've worked with the community, and also before that, I worked for over ten years in the in the health um, in the Ministry of Health. I I don't believe that people actually choose. If you see someone who is choosing, maybe they are experimenting. And we know the age where any child experiments with different stuff. And if people are experimenting, it's a phase and then it passes. But if you see, how could someone choose to be an identity or, is, or to, to, be, to be identified as someone who is so despised by the community? That is, that is not possible. Because you, choose, you want to choose to conform and so that you are you, you know you are not that conspicuous you are you know you are protected by being in a crowd and being invisible so that your life goes on so people you know i do, I, I i don't believe people would choose that uh, <laughs> that uh, toxicity that they face mm -hmm. in terms of toxicity yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. so for, for me it really doesn't matter whether it's natural mm -hmm. or it's by choice mm -hmm. because if i choose to wear suits no one should criminalize me or despise me for it. If I choose to eat banana, no one should despise me or criminalize for it. So what's the difference when it comes to sex and sexuality? Why should anyone be despised or seen differently because they've made a particular choice? So in life, uh, we have things that are inherent that are born within us. And then there are things that we choose as we go along. We should never have feedback or get lashback 
for making a particular choice on any issue. Uh, that is why the second aspect of this year's theme is important, freedom for all. So when we speak of freedom for all, we are speaking of the freedom to choose what we want to be and how we want to interact and behave in society. Mm, I just want to just want to have a follow up on that, Jerry, and say, um, you, you spoke about criminalizing. You spoke about uh, why should someone's choice uh, be made to carry a undesirable burden on them. What, what does the law say about it? How does the law even attempt to protect such people? Um, we have in criminal law, uh, section 79 of the code, if I'm not mistaken, that speaks of sodomy, 79, 76, thereabout. It, it basically criminalizes conduct that would be perceived by any person as uh, immoral. So, for example, bless the way I am sitting with you, if I get into contact with you and she deems it to be sexual in any way, it actually becomes a crime of sodomy. That's how uh, vague and wide that law is phrased. And then we have indecent uh, assault. Uh, that offense occurs when two male adults, for example, consensually, uh, sorry, without consent, have sexual intercourse per annum. It becomes a crime called indecent assault. Uh, so the only difference between sodomy and indecent assault is when it comes to sodomy, there's consent between two individuals. But where there's no consent, instead of calling it rape, it's now called indecent assault. So that's the only difference. So what is basically criminalized is same sex between males. Strangely, the law does not criminalize same sex between females. Mm -hmm. But um, let's, I, I, want us, I want us to, to just delve a little deeper into this, into this aspect of law. It criminalizes same sex marriage. Let's talk about that. Uh, same sex marriage is not criminalized, but it's deemed unconstitutional uh, because the constitution says persons of the same sex cannot, cannot marry. marry. But it becomes a crime if you do, so it's criminalized, is it? No, no, no. It only becomes criminal if you have a consensual sexual intercourse. Okay. It does not criminalize you establishing a family as a couple in that community, in the LGBTQ community, because it says every person has the right to found a family. We've heard of many variations of what a family is. Uh, Child-headed families, we've heard of single mother families, single father families, or just persons on their own becoming families. So if persons of the same sex decide to found a family, it's perfectly constitutional. Uh, the only limitation is what rights can they enjoy? Can they call themselves spouses, for example? They cannot because there's now the prohibition against marriage. Can they inherit from the other? Can you say, uh, my spouse of the same sex has left this as inheritance? Can you claim to be a spouse? It, technically, you cannot because it's not allowed. So there's a limitation to how persons in same-sex relationships can navigate around the law and if their rights protected. Mm. But, 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 but what's, 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 what's interesting to me there, Jerry, as you speak, is that uh, have, uh, having consensual sex becomes sodomy, right? Is it? How, how, do, how does the state get to the point of knowing that there was consensual sex? I mean, how, 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 do, they, how do they even establish that it happened? Um, I'll answer you in three different ways. Uh, number one, the reason why we are having so many people are being charged with indecent assault is they probably would have been evidence that these two are in a relationship. So one of the parties wants to escape that and say, I did not consent to it, and then it becomes indecent assault. So people now hide because they want to free themselves from criminality. So they refuse and say, this was not consensual. And then on the second aspect, uh, well, one of the ways they're discovering it is when you are caught in the middle of the act. Then potentially there is evidence against you. 
because you are caught right in the middle of it. But the third aspect of the crime of sodomy, it's not only about penetration, it's about physical contact. That is deemed by a third person to be immoral between men. So you might not have actual sex, but if you engage in physical contact, that another person subjectively says, this is not wrong. This, can, this type of contact can be between a, a man and a man. It becomes criminal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the question that you're asking is, where do they get the evidence? They probably get you in the act, or there's a guilty lover who then decides to punish you and say, you did this without my consent. So, so, so this this becomes a weapon, a weapon of sorts. Yes, it becomes a weapon. Mm -hmm. Now, Martha, let, let us talk about the time that you you were with working with girls. Um, there were a number of raids around uh, around the offices and, and and you know and raids around people alleged or suspected rather to not conform to what we deem is normal. What effect, were, how, what, what effect or what was the impact of these raids? Yeah, uh, the raids actually instilled uh, fear in, in, the, in the LGBTI community, the members of girls, and, uh, and, and also other, other people in the community, but who were not necessarily members of, of girls. Um, and also fear among the staff who worked at the, at the organization. Um, it also impacted on families of uh, of the staff. Um, sometimes it was uh, maybe children at school. When you have when you have uh, children at school, they and you happen to be in the newspaper, then they do get um, you know verbal insults because of. Of because of the parents and, and the child will not the child will not really have anything to do with with what uh, what the work that the mother is doing and um, or the father is doing so the, so this is the, this this was one of the I think the worst impact was on the children I think but also there are young people there are a lot of uh, members of the LGBTI community who are actually great winners. We're looking after their brothers, sisters, younger brothers, sisters, and it affected them. And sometimes they had to actually physically, temporarily, physically remove themselves from the home. And that is not a nice thing when you have to move away into a strange place and it's and be in hiding in your own country. And you know that you haven't done anything wrong. Um, so it this this also has a negative impact on the on the family. Um, on the on the other hand, uh, the, the, the the negative publicity that that came with, uh, with I, I think the media sort of liked to hide. They like scandal and scandalized whenever there was that issue. It was really scandalized in the media, and uh, probably to sell the papers. Um, Yes, it caused a lot of mental um, mental issues around uh, mental health problems around uh, from the staff and other members of the community. But also, it on the other end, on the positive side, it brought awareness because there are a lot of people out there who even even when uh, I know the the what do you call the, there's the the belief that this is an important but a lot of the people then will now come you know to the organization after the scandalous you know publicity in the in the newspapers people who who had never who had never been in Harare or in any urban city who had, who had never seen a white person and they've been in the rural areas so I said I only knew that I'm not alone when I heard this uh this <laughs> news on the on the on the radio, so I had to look for the organization to say, oh, there are other people like me. So in a way, that <laughs> that um, that was good for those people who actually found you know a way where they could talk to people who could understand them and have proper you know counseling, which is 
which is not cancelling, which is not like telling them, you know, moralizing on them, but actually talking on a level of just talk through your issues and on a, on a understanding level. Mm. So there's, no, there's nothing like negative publicity, is there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but, but was the organization equipped, or is it equipped, to deal with such uh, effects that you talk about, especially the, the, the mental health aspect, you know? Um, I, I, I speak of this because um, I remember um, some, some years ago, I think three years ago, where there was a, a teacher from, from one of these private schools who was forced to leave their job because of, of this. I mean, are people equipped mentally uh, to, to handle such, such challenges? I, th I would say uh, the organization is equipped in the sense that you actually, we had actually established networks and I think the networks continue to grow uh, with, with different professionals who can provide, you know, different services according to the need. So you always knew that when someone approached the organization with such a problem, you know the professional whom you are going to refer to. And you actually tell them we are sending so and so, and you know they get assistance. Um, and um, and I think some of the professionals are people like Jerry, like in the legal system, because legally yes, you really need it. There were no lawyers at Gauss, but the partnership with the, with the human rights lawyers actually helped a lot. So it's, it was also the same with health professionals, with different professionals actually, yeah. It was, was there ever any stigma that made, you, made it difficult for you to, for instance, get partners, uh, like the networks that you are talking about, where someone would say, you know, I, I don't want to be part of this because I would appear as if I am. Yeah, you see, the, the, the way we were all brought up, we were all brought up, mostly, most of the Zimbabweans, it's Christian. The Sunday school and also where you were told, abomination, abomination, and that's what's stuck in the head. What is stuck in the head. And it's very difficult to unlearn and to start. It's a process. So yes, there were those who would say, ah, no, I don't want anything. To, I, I, don't, I don't need to do anything. I also remember even one time going into a counseling session where I thought, oh, this organization, but the counselor, yeah, didn't understand because I was talking about my work. And they say, why don't you just leave? Uh, <laughs> you know, you are qualified to do other things and you can be taken by any organization. But that was not the issue that I used to go about. I didn't need a job. And they were talking about me getting, you know, finding another job. Amazing. Now, now Jerry, I want to come to, I want to, come to you, you know, and, and say, have, have you ever dealt with any other, any other, you know, any cases around this that you've appeared in court, you know, uh, um, and, and, either litigated or defended? Uh, yes, yes I have. Um, so when you're asking Martha about the raid, it's one of those cases that I actually went to attend to. Uh, what struck me uh, while attending to the raid in particular is the interaction and exchange that I had with the police. Uh, they came armed with a search warrant in which they wanted to search for drugs and dangerous substances. So I innocently and genuinely asked them, why are you even having a search warrant that speaks of drugs and dangerous substances? And their excuse was that you can never be gay, you can never be lesbian unless you are high on a particular substance. So we want to find those substances and once we take them, we'll eliminate this problem. So that was the first uh, kind of encounter interception I got from uh, the police. Well, they couldn't find the drugs, they couldn't find any dangerous substances at the girls' offices. They then decided that they were going to seize all the computers and documents at the offices. So they then went to their office and started actively looking for a charge based on what they could find, either in the computers or in the documents at girls. So they eventually settled on two offenses. Uh, one of them was possession of pornographic materials, uh, and the second one was insulting or undermining the authority of the president, because at the time there was a plaque uh, that was containing a message from uh, Willis Brown Jr., I think, 
in which he was speaking against the sentiments that were said by Robert Mugabe and that you spoke of earlier on. So they said, if you have a plaque that directly contradicts what the president said, you are insulting him and you are undermining him. So that's the most they could get in terms of preferring a charge against girls. Uh, and then when it comes to possession of pornographic material, some of the material they were relying on were condoms. Because inside the condom search yet there is that illustration of how you use the condom. And to the police that was pornographic material. And that was the basis for, part of the basis for laying the charge against them. That's how ridiculous the charges went. When they couldn't find anything else, they then said, you are running an unregistered organization. But our law allows for uh, common law universities to operate. And girls at the time, I'm not sure about now, was operating as a common law universities. Mm. So yes, Martha was actually a victim in that particular <laughs> charge. Yeah, but let's, let's, I want to talk about, about uh, this, this, this case. Why is it so, why was it so difficult for, for the police um, to find a charge? Firstly, because they didn't find anyone at the premises engaging in sexual conduct, uh, same-sex same sex conduct. Uh, and secondly, when you are dealing with issues relating to intimacy, these are issues that normally take place in private. So it's rare for you to find a case unless there's a violation of the other person's right, where there is no consent, uh, for example. But as long as the relations are consensual, there is absolutely no way in which the police will actually find a charge to prefer. This is why they end up going to the peripheries, trying to establish how organizations got registered, uh, whether they are high on drugs or substances, whether they possess any pornographic material. So it's more like a, a catch-all scenario. Mm. They try to find something to clutch on although they really have nothing. But, but the, does, does it also speak to the fact that the Zimbabwean law, you know, uh, uh, respects everyone's human rights, yet there are some people who want to effectively disrespect by nitpicking? Yes, I would agree. Uh, if we look at just two rights from the Constitution, the first one is the right to equality, in which all persons are regarded as equal uh, before the law. And then the second one, and most important for me, is Section 76 that deals with health rights. It includes in the definition of health rights, sexual health and reproductive rights. Now, when you go to the United Nations definition of SRHR rights, they include safe, satisfying, and pleasurable sex. So if that is the definition of the right, and a person enjoys safe sex, enjoys pleasurable sex, and enjoys uh, satisfying sex when it's only same sex, then it's perfectly constitutional. It's allowed in the Constitution. Now, do people need to pick? Yes, they do. What is it based on? It's based on political prejudices. So we've always been having these issues because uh, back then, the president then, Robert Mugabe, was a very homophobic person. He did not look at them in any kind of way. So the people, uh, or rather the police, in a desperate bid to please the president, would rush and make endless raids and arrest any person perceived to be part of the community. They were trying to please their master, the political master. So outside politics, outside uh, zealous religion, outside the zealous and often misconceived cultures, there is no other reason why uh, the, that community is targeted for victimization. Mm -hmm. It's not about the law, it's about those prejudices around culture, religion, and politics. Amazing. Now, now Martha, I want to come to you and say, um, and, and just try and understand, um, what are some of the human rights violations that, that you have experienced during your time uh, as working, working with girls? 
Okay, I I think the first one, having been from a health background, I think the first one was when people went to went to a health facility. Um, I remember if it was an STI, um, this guy went in and wanted treatment, but they had a source in the anal area. So when the nurse looked at them, they, they started calling all the other nurses, come and see, come and see, which is, I, th I think this was a real violation. And this person was saying, I'll never go back again. And telling that story means a lot of others who would, you know, get any STI would not even go to the health facility because they are now so scared of, of how the nurses would treat them, uh, how the health, let's say health staff in general. So, yeah, so that was uh, one thing. Then the other, the other violations have been around uh, the religious institutions where uh, people are taken through um, what I would call conversion therapy, maybe the exorcisms, you know. You, it's like a demon. <laughs> yeah, you have demons are possessing you. We need to get rid of these demons. Um, we need to, even our traditional religion would actually take them to the to the river or take them through all these, uh, you know, fungi uh, or you know, different sorts of, uh, which, which in a way actually, you know, the the person whom they are saying they are, <laughs> they are, you know, helping be helping to deliver from these demons actually came out worse off than they were before because of that because of the of the violations the educational institutions as well we've known of schools which have i don't know whether it's suspicion or they actually you know established that uh, either girls were lesbians in a boarding school or boys were you know homosexuals in a boarding school and they actually expelled them. And sometimes in universities are terrible because people were outed and it was just to shame people to be able so that they are unable to socialize uh, on campus. So these are some of the worst violations. And also even going to report a rape, if you are raped, like Jeremiah talked about the other so part of where people are just victimized. But if you are really, you know, raped by, by a man, when you are a man and you go to report to the police and you, you end up being, you end up getting arrested yourself or, or being left it. And if it's a, if it's a woman who is known to be a lesbian and they report that they've been raped, it's, to them it's not a case. It's like, you know, women, are, women who are lesbians are getting raped so that they are they are taught how to, you know, how to be real women because they say real women, you know, would want to sleep with a man, but <laughs> not necessarily. And um, and so it's the case is it just falls away. People do not know the way to report those. Are, so I think just to mention a few of the violations, yeah, that's that's what I would. Yeah, but there are so many, there are so many violations. What what has been what has been the real effect of those violations to to the community to families? You know, what has been the real real effect? Uh, the violations cause a lot of fear. They, it also causes yeah a lot of fear. It's it damages people. It it prevents people from actively interacting socially in the way they should uh, in their community. Because I think before people put a label, they will interact with the person just like, you know, the moment someone labels that person, uh, then everything changes. It's like some, someone is switched on something and it's like, how do you switch on from being this nice person and all of a sudden you are just because people know that this is your preference or your identity, uh, gender identity or your sexual orientation, which, which, which doesn't make sense t to me. But that's how prejudiced we have become in Zimbabwe. Mm. Yeah. But you, you, you were working with girls. Did, did you ever suffer any, uh, you know, violations on yourself as a worker, as a person who was working with girls? Yeah, I think there were uh, three, uh, 
I went through three arrests. Um, I I went to yeah, part, some of them were attended to by Jerry, and uh, I've also had uh, religious people sometimes phoning or sometimes just confronting you. Um, from your church? Not from different churches. Okay. Yeah, from different churches. People from my church I invited. I invited the like the head of late to when they when they heard I was working for girls and they wanted to take me through <laughs> an interrogation. I, I invited them to the office. Um, and when they came and just showing them this is this is what we do and gave them pamphlets and you know and yeah, they, they were still saying, but, you know, I prayed about it, but God says, this is not right. And I say, what is not right? <laughs> and they, they couldn't articulate what is not right. And so I think it, I think they were shocked uh, because what they expected to see is not what they saw. And also the fact that I openly invited them to come to my workplace. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people had these misconceptions about what... Uh, what the office, the workplace at Gauss is like. Um, some, I, I remember the first time I brought some journalists, they told her, but we were told there's a double story and that there are lots of beds here where people, <laughs> you know, have different partners, etc. <laughs> yeah, so when they just saw that it's an office with just desks and computers and, you know, files, <laughs> it's very boring actually from what they were expecting. So, yeah, so. Yeah, those violations, I, I remember also sometimes uh, trying to get a medical aid for the for the staff at Gauss and going to one of the one of the prominent medical aid uh, societies. Um, yeah, the person at the front desk really just, you know, was so you know, the way she laughed when she when I said this is the organization I coming from Gauss. And then, ah, girls, what, that, what does that stand for? Then I said, okay, guys, and this is also about it. And, you know, the way she laughed and called the others, and I think she thought this would, you know, make me, you know, disappear. And so I, I wrote to the CEO and he, then had a meeting, and she was, she, of course, she was denying that she never did, but from that day, we treated with the utmost respect in, in that organization. And um, and I know that people, the staff, really got their the medical aid that they they deserve. So would, already, if I had been fearful, that would have meant uh, you know not going back to the medical aid society and thinking, okay, I can't I can't approach any medical aid society because they don't like this community. So then people would have been deprived of something that they could easily get through their employer. Mm -hmm. now, 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 Jerry, is, is there any improvement in terms of respecting uh, rights for everyone in Zimbabwe? Unfortunately, um, I haven't seen any real improvement uh, because people are still being arrested uh, for expressing themselves uh, sexually. There's still a lot of stigma around LGBTIQ rights and there's still a lot of homophobia against them, so there is still no respect for their rights as a community. But what, what can be done to legally, um, you know, uh, before we go to the human aspect of it? What can be done legally is to amend the laws, uh, firstly to decriminalize sodomy, uh, to decriminalize certain aspects of indecent assault. Uh, when I'm speaking of decriminalizing, I'm simply saying do not make these criminal offenses. I'm not saying go ahead and make it a law that people can then start engaging in ABCD. No, just remove it from the statute books and let people as humans regulate themselves as they do. Uh, in every other area. In 1957, uh, the UK had a commission, the Wolfenden Commission, where they were inquiring on whether it was necessary to maintain uh, criminal laws that made same-sex relationships illegal. 
One of the findings of that committee, which was very interesting to me, is that the basis or rationale for wanting to criminalize same-sex relations uh, took root from morality. But with the evolving moral standards, values and beliefs that we have, by whose moral standards should we judge the next person? Because our morality is not constant, it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. And then they said there's a, that there's a part of morality uh, that relates to privacy, which should never, ever be the concern of the law. So in short, for as long as there's no allegation of compulsion when it comes to sexual matters, the law should strictly stay outside people's bedrooms. The law cannot regulate who a person sleeps with, how many times they sleep with that person, or their preferred sexual positions. It's simply not the business of the law. Mm. And, 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 and the law uh, wants to behave like a ref in the WWE. <laughs> yeah. um, but Martha, I mean, as we, as we wrap up, as, as a member of a community, as, as, as a human being, you know, because we're talking about humans here, we're talking about equality, we're talking about freedom for all human beings. As, but what message would you share, Martha, with with you know, fellow Zimbabweans with the community um, around this matter? Yeah, I, what I would want to say to the to, to Zimbabweans at large is, um, is that a lot of the prejudice that we see also comes from fear, particularly in families, because uh, the, 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 the nuclear family for a lot of LGBTI community has become the source of uh, extreme violence. Um, and this is because the reaction of the parents or the guardians, when they discover that uh, their son or their child is, is prefers same sex or identifies a different gender from what they they were assigned a bed or what they thought <laughs> they were um is it comes from it comes from fear and this fear we are just imposing imposing fear on each other but then when you impose fear on one person on on a person uh, because of the attitude that you that you have you don't even know whether tomorrow your child will also turn out and say and come out to you to say they are gay or they are lesbian or that they are trans. Um, and I think um, to a lot of parents, I think they then think that it's, it's their fault. They think that they've done something. But I think it's a real reassurance to parents or guardians that they, they haven't done anything. This is just a person who they are how they've turned out to be and also as they grow into adults like Jeremiah said the the choices that they've made about themselves as as they grow. So it, it, it should never be about, you know, self blame and you know, I think what I've also seen is that parents who are accepting of their child actually have a more balanced and do not have any of the what people would call dramas because people a lot of people I see on social media say why do you have all this drama? I think it's because the the public invites the drama. And when when people are accepted there's no drama. <laughs> yeah. So this so I, I just think we should just let people be. Just remember that we have a universal declaration of human rights and we should respect everyone. We would with everyone for all freedom for all dignity and justice for all. But what, what would you say to those who raise the, the morality flag and, and, and also maybe argue that the, when you violate the, the certain morals, you then also violate their freedom, their, their, their rights to dictate here as well? You know, a lot of these people are actually the ones who violate other people's freedoms and, uh, and also who also have very questionable morals. So when I was hoping this person would come to me about morals because um, 
because I see a lot of people trying to hide behind that, but they don't really look at themselves. I think people should introspect more when they think of morals rather than think of what the other person is doing so that they also don't infringe on others. Yeah. Mm. Like like Jerry said, the, the, the law should stay away from out of yes. people's bedrooms. Yes. But but Jerry, I want I want you in, in your conclusion, you know, I want you to talk to us as a human being. No, not not as a not as a lawyer, not not as a, as as a, um, as that guy who's just you know handed over handed in his. PhD <laughs> dissertation. By the way, congratulations! But uh, uh, but I want to I want you to talk as as a human being, you know, to to reach out to someone's uh, you know inner being in terms of basic human rights. In terms of why should we care about about rights, you know, uh, in a non legalistic way. Um, I, I'll do that by quoting from two sources. First source that I'll quote is the Zimbabwean singer, uh, late singer, Efat Mujuru. One of his most popular songs, he asks a rhetoric question, Mwono is Andam Gariru Wakandi Iko Basipan. Andam Gariru, Mgariru Wakanak. So when speaking of human dignity, we all strive to have a life that is satisfying, uh, to have a life that makes us whole, a life that makes us complete. So as humans, we must never make choices that infringe on the next person's choice. Let us allow the next person to be as whole, as complete, and as pleasant as they can be as a human. So that brings me to the second uh, portion that I want, source that I want to quote from, and it's the Bible. Uh, treat others as you want to be treated yourself. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. So if you do not want to be criticized, ridiculed, or treated differently for any choice that you make in life, do not do the same to the next person uh, to you. Treat them in the same way that you want to be treated. What makes us human, what makes us whole, what com makes us complete is that uh, respect of each other's private space. Let us just maintain that respect. You have your private space, I have my private space, let's respect that. What any other person does behind their closed doors, as long as it does not harm me, then I should not worry about it. So what we must always ask ourselves is, when we say the LGBTI community is immoral or does things that are illegal, we must always ask ourselves, what harm are they doing to you? If there's no harm that, that is being done to you, it should not be your concern. Mm -hmm. Now, now, now maybe speaking as a lawyer, what, why, why should people care about human rights? Because that is what makes us whole. That is the central essence of our survival. And it is actually the primary reason why we decided to come into society. Uh, as John Locke said, we came into society to preserve our rights so that we could do away with the law of the jungle, where the survival of the fittest. Once we accept that we are in society for the preservation of our rights, it means we want to preserve collective rights. When we are speaking of collective rights, we are speaking of the rights of every person, whether they are in the minority or they are in the majority, whether they are vulnerable or they are in a position of privilege. Every right must be protected. Every person's right must be guaranteed. Amazing. Now, thank you very much to my amazing guests, Martha and, and Jerry. Uh, for us, um, we were having this discussion around, um, you know, the International Day of Human Rights and how we, everybody's um, rights have to be protected regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity or the profession that they choose. You know, uh, uh, colleagues always say lawyers are liars. As you know, I mean, we need to respect their, their human rights and dignity as well. But this has been and this is the situation right now with me. Your host, as usual, Dara, in partnership with girls. Now, 
something very important as we were having this discussion, uh, you know, the law should stay out of people's bedrooms. I mean, it's very, very important as long as consensual. Um, I mean, it's it's assumed that when people enter into bedrooms, they they, are, they do so in their own free will and and and, and consensual. And 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 Jerry speaks about a basic human right that people want to have pleasurable consensual sex. Safe and satisfying. Safe and satisfying sex. Now that's 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 you know you know the law is ridiculous, but right? I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> it's always nice to have you, Jerry. Uh, you know, um, and and to hear your your views around the law as you continue to work around the clock uh, to defend human rights activists like Martha herself, who's, who who. who, who who has been your client as I have been. <laughs> and and Martha, thank you very much. You know, I know you're a health professional and you took it upon yourself um, to work in a space where everybody else at that time that you took up that position did not want to work in that space. And you put yourself at harm's way, uh, arrested, uh, you know, harassed and even your pastor praying for you. <laughs> but, you know, this, this is what we do to defend those that can't speak for themselves. This is what we do to build a better society. This is what we do to build a better Zimbabwe. And this is commendable. And, and thank you very much uh, for coming through. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. This is Heart and Soul TV and Radio, and we are the heart and soul of this nation. And we are the alternative voice. We give everybody a voice and we make sure that Zimbabweans begin to find each other on this platform. And this is what I was born to do. Thank you very much. I am your host as usual, Dara. On this Heart and Soul TV and radio in power partnership with girls, with me your host Dara. Until next time, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.